Good evening to everybody and welcome. It's uh, my great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Kirk, who doesn't need any introduction, uh, actually, because everybody knows uh, uh, his work and what he, he means for Egyptology. But I just would like to say a few words to present him for those, to the few of you who might not know him. He studied Egyptology at the University of Cambridge, specializing in hieratic writing of the Middle Kingdom with a focus on social history. He worked, he has worked as curator in the Department of Egyptian Antiquities at the British Museum. Then he moved to the University College of London and he became curator at the Peters Museum. Since 2014, he has been work as a lecturer, lecturer in the Institute of Archaeology at UCL. He has published, uh, he has a, a huge number of uh, publication on many different fields. Uh, uh, we can just uh, remember, uh, remind a few of his, uh, of his works, like the UCL Lahum Papari, Hidden Hands, Egyptian Workforces in Petri Excavations Archives, or Exploring Religion in Ancient Egypt and Birth Tusks, the Armory of Health in Context. And <clears throat> This will be also the subject of uh, his lecture tonight, uh, Middle Kingdom Birth Tasks and an Enigmatic Coffin in Turing, Traveling Authenticity. And we are all willing to hear the reconstruction uh, and the discussion that Professor Kirk will do of these tasks present uh, in the, um, the Petri collections to see the analogy with the representation uh, that we have in a coffin at the Museo Egizio, and to uh, hear from his very voice something that is very dear to him. So how much can an object tell us and what should a museum do with objects that might be uh, problematic since of our unprovenance and how can we uh, reconstruct the story that the museum tell us, especially when it might be a contested or disputed uh, story? Is it a, a, an original ancient Egyptian story or is it a modern tale? So, well, Stephen, welcome. And I would like to give the word for you. I'm sorry that uh, we are online. I was hoping uh, to uh, have you here in Turing, first of all, to examine our coffee, but also to be to deliver your lecturing presence. But uh, as we say in Italia, I hope this is a kind of aperitivo, and then you will come back for the real meal uh, very soon, inshallah. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for this uh, very generous introduction. I will try not to focus too much on the uh, more troubling aspects of the modern hand on objects in the collections. But the tusk you see at the lower left is an item that has left me with doubts since I was a curator formerly in the Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology here at UCL. And turning to the coffin in Turin, when I will finally arrive one day and see it again, um, is perhaps not uh, the moment at which both items become suspect, but where both of them acquire a new window of authenticity, uh, maybe more complex, involve more layers of the authentic uh, and of different periods than is available at first sight. So I should say initially that I will not be showing details of the coffin interim. I will come back to it at the end of this presentation, but I'd like you to look at the tusk on the lower left side, which is an item, as I say, in the London University collection here, and tell you what troubles me about it. I would like also to open this presentation with a hymn of praise to Hartwig Altenmüller, who over 60 years ago, um, was working on these tasks and completed in 1965 and published his dissertation. And all the decades since has been publishing and it's been a real delight this 
week to see announced his Zeichen der Apotropäer on the connection between the Middle Kingdom material I am looking at and the later evidence of stars and constellations. So I would very strongly encourage anyone interested in the topic to follow my footsteps in looking through all of these wonderful publications. I just pick out there three of the articles in the interim, the 1990s, 2010s, which I have depended on very heavily for my own understanding of this material. It is hard to imagine when we look at ancient material how much separates us from it, particularly in the museum where we have the illusion of an immediate contact. And maybe this digital environment is a good moment to think hard about that. It is always in Egypt, along the, va the valley, along the flood plain, it is always about the Nile. Nile with a surface, a water surface shimmering in a hot Saharan sun. And keep this image in mind when we are looking at other images later, you have to detranquilize yourself. You have to get out of the anesthesis of modernity when you look at ancient material from the Nile Valley. Uh, we, we have a very long way to go, not least because the material itself needs a, a colossal shock to our system for us to wake up. A shock like the Andy Goldsworthy sand work which uh, James Putnam's Time Machine um, exhibited in the British Museum uh, in the 1990s, and then using, instead of the yellow sand, a local black sand in uh, Turin in the sculpture gallery and miraculously mirrored on the ceiling by the trace of the snake's tail. What particularly attracted me to the Goldsworthy artwork in the Turin setting was the, the, the blackness. It was the, the way it spoke to the blackness of the statues and the way that other Egyptologists have seen the choice of stone having meaning. Because the river itself was not tranquil in ancient times throughout the year. Exactly at this point of the year came the rising of the Nile. And you have to think of the Nile bringing a flood of mud as well as water. And we all know that, we all know every year there's an annual flood, but even the word inundation in the English rendering is flat. It takes away the force. So with Richard Parkinson, you need to think about the sound, the thundering sound of the Nile at the first cataract and at the bends of the river, which you can still capture if you go further upstream south to Ethiopia to the Blue Nile Falls. But since the construction of the Aswan Dam, the first one, and then the High Dam, we have these pictures to rely on to try to capture what the ancient Egyptian and the medieval Egyptian and the 19th century Egyptian knew very well. Yes, we can see the photograph of the Nile flood around Asyut at the upper left, and it seems rather tranquil because the flood has happened there. The floodwaters have settled. This is not July, August, the moment of terror, where you didn't know whether the flood would be so low you would starve or so high, as in the lower picture by Sarah Belzoni, uh, whether your homes would be swept away in a catastrophically high dam. With Fikri Hassan, we have to remember that every year was un entirely unpredictable. It was scientifically unpredictable. You cannot calculate a set of good years and a set of bad years. So this is what you have to hold in mind. There is a moment around about now, mid-July, where people know that soon their next year will be determined along the whole of the Nile Valley in Egypt, into the Delta. People would know how much food they would have and how safe and prosperous they would be, but they wouldn't know until the very moment of the flood itself, until it arrived. So keep that urgency in mind, and even the pallid watercolour of the overflowing of the Nile, uh, you need to read uh, Giovanni Battista Veltoni's description of the Nile, of the human misery it cost, to understand how you should think when you look at these objects. So I'm going to be looking 
with my problem pieces at the top uh, right, at worked tasks with processions of figures. And I'm starting from that object of doubt. I will then look through the context, archeological context, which might tell us something about the date and possibly the function. If we don't find enough about the function from the content, then we can start defining in part by the contrast. So those will be the three sections of my talk now. And I will come back at the end to the coffin in the Museo Gizio um, to see whether it reverses or intensifies that stressful doubt. This is why I have doubts about the piece in the Petri Museum. First of all, the motifs are in part unusual. And I'm thinking particularly not of the vulture, the lion hippopotamus, um, perhaps slightly this baboon-like figure in the middle is a problem piece. And um, not so much about the bands at the edges, at the right edge, but it's the flowers, it's the plants. What do I have against plants, you may ask? I have nothing against plants, but they're not on any of the other tusks. So I would like to know why you get these papyrus triangles, why you have the papyrus marsh motif at the left and what these branches are doing. Maybe there are good explanations and we will look at that. I'm also worried a little about the alignment of the figures walking along the outer edge of the tusk and on the inner, the proximal side of the tusk only. And they've left that line, I don't know if you can see, along the inner part of the uh, tusk, so the upper uh, edge as placed here through the heads of some of the figures. They've left that commissure from the natural formation of the trihedral section of a hippopotamus tusk. And that's again something I haven't seen. So when you have not seen it, you start to ask questions. When you find out that there is no excavated provenance for it, your doubts intensify. We think this was purchased by Flinders Petrie at some point. Um, we must have been before the publication of the book where he included it, his inventory of objects of daily use in his collection, 1927. And after the Second World War, um, probably Tony Arkell, the curator then gave it the number it now has for us to identify it, 16386, without which we don't have a further link to information in the paper trail. But as far as I can find so far, we don't know where this came from. We'll come back to this later, but I'd like you to keep in particular an eye open for the wrapping of these figures, the strange animal headed figure right at the middle, and just keep your eyes open for plants. It's always important as Vivian Davis emphasizes to open your eyes and look hard when you're looking at Egyptian art. Don't just take a general view, look at the detail. Remember what the material is. It's from the low canine of the hippopotamus. These are not cuddly creatures. If you live on the Nile, you have a different experience. The lower canine is to fight and potentially to kill. The hippopotamus is a horse of the river because it runs so fast, it's so powerful. So this is solid power, this is a force of nature and the large curving lower canine provided the material, but they didn't just take it and carve the surface. We'll now look into the excavated examples to see how much help the archeological provenance of other examples gives us. This is the full range that I had found. There are more now, wonderful new find of the Spanish excavation at Thebes, the Middle Kingdom Cemetery overlain by the Temple of Tutmos III, and new uh, examples I'm sure will appear in the future. But for the moment, this is what the time I was looking five years ago at this corpus was published and available or known to me through archive. And you see there's a concentration in Licht and Thebes, the residence area of the Middle Kingdom, Licht, at the border of Lower and Upper Egypt, and Thebes, the southern city, Niwetreset in the ancient Egyptian term, 
uh, in the controlling point at the bend of uh, the Nile just south of modern Gena, uh, allowing control of resources also from the Red Sea and from Nubia, which was occupied at the time of the Middle Kingdom as far as the Second Cataract. There are some examples outside Egypt, and there's a contrast here. All the ones from inside Egypt seem to come from the Middle Kingdom, and the ones outside Egypt turn up in later periods equivalent to the New Kingdom or late Second Intermediate period. So they seem to take their time to travel outside the country. But maybe that's just an accident of the record. They can have animal heads at the tip. They can be completely plain, but I'll be concentrating on the most common type where you have a figure series. And I'm going to try to encourage you to think of the type of figures, not only individually, but as a group, as a collective, they are the tusk figure series. I want to know what these creatures are doing so I can come back to the example in the Petrie Museum and decide how it fits in or doesn't. There may be differences between regions and the archeological map is always fragmentary. So far, it's possible to indicate stylistic variation, maybe with the example from the Kingdom of Kerma, whether that was carved in Egypt or in Nubia, but it comes from the second intermediate period context. Maybe the examples with the uh, uh, figures all placed on a little basket, uh, the sign for uh, the Lord, uh, Neb, uh, the ancient Egyptian word for basket is Neb, so they use it also for their words, Lord and every, which also Neb. So this is both multiplying and assigning power to these figures. And the example on the left is from Rifa in Middle Egypt, just south of Asyut. Um, and this has one of these uh, series of figures sitting on these little baskets. So maybe that's a feature of that area. You find them at Abydos as well, a little further south. In general, though, it's a very unitary corpus, which is why I encourage you to think of these as a collective. They are doing a single job. And we'll come back at the end to the idea of what they might be doing together. I would like you to look out for movement. We tend to make Egyptian art as static as Winkelmann did. We kill it stone dead so that the Hellenistic drapery can flow in a very orientalizing tradition of the approach to ancient Egypt, which is not necessarily present in either ancient Greek or ancient Roman reception of Egypt. But here, um, you have to look beyond the assumption that these are just static figures placed um, in a row. Uh, look for movement, which of them might be moving. And I won't answer all of these questions. I want you to think about them. The major site for knowing anything about the Middle Kingdom would be Lisht, the cemeteries alongside the pyramids of the first two kings of the 12th dynasty, Senors at the first and Amenemhat the first. They were excavated in the early 20th century uh, when the landscape looked as you see in the photograph at the top and the expedition that um, was in charge of the excavation uh, was an American one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So very many of the finds are now in the Metropolitan in the division system. This was during the second directorship of Gaston Maspero. Maspero was very keen to send as much material um, outside Egypt because he had a new museum, the Egyptian Museum Tahrir Square, but it was already full long before Tutankhamun was um, excavated. So it was already crammed full and on a pragmatic basis, uh, any means to store the objects, he allowed large numbers of objects um, to go. That should be a familiar story to anyone who has studied the history of Egyptology, but it's important to think about that as well. So here we have probably just west of where the resident city itself was. We don't know where Ichtawi was, we think it was just uh, adjacent. Um, this is where not only at the time of the 12th dynasty kings, but later people lived and were buried. And from those burials, we have in the late Middle Kingdom, some of the 
only examples of well-documented finds of tusks. So if you wanted to know, were these objects used by men or women, by the elderly or the young or children, this is where you start. But we only have one example where there's a single burial and the body in the coffin, very heavily destroyed, was only very tentatively identified as that of a man. So this is as close as you can get to that question. Fortunately, on the back of several of the excavated items, you have a hieroglyphic inscription that will give you the information. Here, um, for a child, masculine, um, born to a woman of high status. So this is a very spectacular example. You can really feel, I hope, uh, remember the picture of the hippopotamus, you can feel the energy, the size, the power. It's one of the most dramatic curves and uh, the longest of these tusks. So it's an example where if you look hard at the images, you can see the same power as in the natural history photograph of the 21st century. This same site was, uh, as I say, home to people living in later periods than Amenemhat the first and Senatret the first. They lived in the 20th century BC, in the late 19th and 18th century BC. These houses grew up alongside the edge of the pyramid of Amenemhat the first. And here in this cluster of housing was found uh, an area covered with a lot of filed scrap as if it had been a factory for glazing. This is contested, the date is not certain, but it seems that there's some intense presence, particularly because the jar, very famous in Egyptian ceramic studies, with its mixture of Minoan dolphin and these Levantine bird motifs on a Levantine jar form, perhaps this is made in a mixed culture environment like Tel Edaba in the Northeast Delta, that was from a tomb under one of these houses, which also contained the coffin of a man called the Behni with the title Overseer of Clay's Workers. So it's quite a busy environment. And in the houses around, in the tombs beneath them, several examples of the tusks emerged. And amongst those from the tomb numbered 885 by the Metropolitan X, Tradition, you have a find of one very damaged tusk and one broken but otherwise much better preserved. And much more importantly, you have the little items at top right, the drawings of the pottery that came from the tomb. So this is your best chance to know of all the individuals who are buried in this archaeological context exactly when they lived. So it's that little ellipsoid bottle that should already be the middle of the 12th dynasty. We're around about 1900 BC, a little bit afterwards. So we're into that 19th, 18th century BC threshold. Why am I insisting on these date details? Is this just chronological number crunching? Think of your own families. Think of your own lives. How can you possibly connect humanly to any other object if you are not thinking of generations, of the length of use of practices? I want to know when this practice was a human practice, when people were using it. So for me, it's important to know, is this something that ancient Egyptians did from the beginning of time to today? If it's constrained to one period, I'd like to know exactly when. Does that tell us something about the period itself? We'll come back again to these individual animals, but the one at the bottom is really a masterwork of carving. Do not be deceived again by another uh, modern uh, assumption that magic means folk, means something outside the palace cross. There is a very rich interplay between the different levels of society. And here you see a hieroglyphic formulation which ties in with the inscriptions that refer to people at the level of the palace. So this is perfect forming of Egyptian art. Not many people in the reception of Egypt later could ever attain this kind of quality. So every line means something. Let's look at the next um, context then, which is Thebes. 
and the three areas of the West Bank cemeteries where we find in the excavation record the figures on tusks of the Assasis, the Ramasim, and the Abel Negar. Most of them along Dabal Nega, which is the part immediately facing Karnak. Um, the Assasif example is a little bit out of the usual span of uh, finds of these objects. It's quite close to the temple of King Mentuhotep II at Deir Bahri, next to the famous Hatshepsut temple that many of you are know. So again, just to give you um, uh, an image of what these objects look like. There were parts of four of the tusk with their figure series, along with a whole set of other objects, but not from an intact chamber. However extraordinary the objects are, we don't know how many people they were related to. Um, they were found around a box which is more famous for containing papyri, including famous works of literature. Papyri are now in Berlin and in London, and they include um, the, um, some of the most remarkable ritual papari from the Middle Kingdom. Very badly damaged, but superbly edited by Zeta Gardner and through now to contemporary scholars such as uh, David Laurent and uh, Christine Geis. Uh, so here we have the tusk from more recent excavations by uh, Daniel Poltz's team at Rabel Negar, uh, tucked into the side of one of the early Middle Kingdom pillared um, corridor tombs, uh, chapels. Uh, there is this shaft tomb, uh, which seemed to be mainly full of later pottery, but it contained this remarkable task, which is one of the ones where the objects speak, the figures in the series speak. They say with the independent pronoun, which in um, Egyptian is very strong, the inek, um, the each of the four main figures says, I am in a So the figure you may think of as Taweret, she doesn't say I'm Taweret, she says, I am Reru, with a masculine ending. Um, the figure in the middle, who you may think of as Bez, is telling you, I am Aha, the fighter. Unfortunately, we can't work out the inscription of the figure with the griffin. Um, body form and a human head floating between the wings in the middle. And some have read this um, or follow Altimuller in reading it as the god in Heret, the one who brings the distant goddess who embodies the flood water, Hathor, returning from the desert. And the last figure, which is named on the left, uh, tells us I am Hesem, which seems to be a word of power. And uh, this is a lion upright on his uh, hind legs. So, um, very important find for showing the ancient inscriber providing the name emanating from the figures, but not for the turtle, the wesser stick, uh, or the toad at the left end. So quite a specific choice. And finally, the assassif, you have an example really found in action against the plastered eastern wall of the enclosure of a tomb chapel for the general Intef who fought for King Nepepetra Mentuhotep, the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, Mentuhotep is the king who reunited Egypt in the 21st century BC. And in the blue circle, you see the location of the enclosure, the tomb chapel. But the photographs on the right are really miraculous. It was found with its cordage still tied on. This is not one of the tusks with figure series. We have a sense of someone using, maybe even wearing it as a belt and then wrapped around as Christina Riggs has um, explored the way that uh, the, the wrapping is an essential part of any containment of power and preservation of the power for the person that much too often in a chauvinist Egyptology has just been discarded and uh, we don't uh, always know. Uh, for example, with the bronze figurines found in the 1960s by Professor Emery at Sagara, um, with their uh, linen wrappings, we don't always know where that linen is now. 
So we must do better in archaeology, of course, we are doing better now, um, but it's a reminder of a distance between their importance and ours. So we can delineate this corpus form. Uh, in the documented excavation, we find um, 48 of these shaped hippopotamus lower canines with figures. Eight of them don't have figures, but they have that little long-eared feline or maybe canine head at the end. And the six of them uh, have no figures at all. So maybe there were more, and I'll come back to this question. Uh, you don't need to think very hard when you're looking back at the Petri Museum example to see how someone might have a broken ancient object and increase its interest to a purchaser, which is where collectors uh, boost the market and create a new production of, of the ancient. And maybe the same with a perfectly plain one. So maybe there are fewer of those because some of them have been siphoned off to produce new figure series. Nevertheless, within the excavated record, it is encouraging that sometimes the plain tusks without figures are documented, and those do within that documented corpus seem to be the minority. So I think that's probably a fair sign that you have what you might call a hegemonic form. So you're coming close to the compositional choice, the concept of uh, the work. If you want within the museum to distinguish one period from another, not only modern from ancient, of course you need this. And that's what I'd like to focus on now. The form itself has been known since the beginning of Egyptology in 1824, exactly when the collection acquisition uh, was being finalized from uh, Bernardino Trovetti to the Museo Egizio, uh, or the Museo Egizio Rose has been founded from that acquisition. Um, at that time, the Louvre acquired um, the Edmé Durand collection, and there there was already uh, one of these uh, quite detailed series of figures with some writing on it. Not here giving names, but insisting on the protection of life. On the right, you find one from the Franco-Tuscan expedition of Jean-François Champollion with the Polito Rossellini in 1828, 1829, where uh, this piece again uh, is in the Louvre. It was acquired by Champollion specifically for the Louvre during his uh, time in Egypt. So the, the type is known, but it's not very well known. And Champollion does not seem to have chosen it. Sylvie Guichard has a wonderful reconstruction of Champollion's first display of Egyptian objects in Paris before the 1830 revolution. And um, this object perhaps arrived too late. Uh, to be included on display there. But even when objects are displayed, they don't always enter the academic consciousness. People don't see them until they're in publications and people write about them. So that's a lesson to us as well. We should publish object types so that we are aware of what the range of ancient production was. Each new find will tell you something about how the ancients worked with their materials, like a kaleidoscope. Each element will change the picture and change the meaning of everything else, which is why I want to know not only when they started being made, these Tusk figure series, um, but also when they stopped. And you may often have seen in discussions of this subject, this wonderful piece acquired by Wallace Budge reported to the trustees of the British Museum in December 1886. I'm grateful to John Taylor for letting me know the archival documentation on this piece and registered um, the next year, so formally acquired in 1887. And often you'll see it in the books. This is a typical example of what people often call a uh, a, a magic wand or a magic ivory or a magic knife from the late Middle Kingdom. It is not. And when Budge reported it, he didn't say anything of the kind. He said this is a collar of ivory, which is also how some of the earlier collections described these. Because notice how the artist created the imagery. All these items, all these uh, figures rather, 
are walking along the longer outside line. So this is doing something different. It's not a single line series, but it's four figures interspersed with double register, uh, either two or three smaller figures. So a bit like beading a necklace with spaces in it. So you have again, the hippopotamus lion filling the height at the right. In the middle, either side of the double headed sphinx, you have a long necked feline to the right, to the left, the lion snake uh, man figure holding snakes like uh, the New Kingdom Bez. And on the left, you have this extraordinary kneeling figure holding snakes. On the back, we're told who this is for. Words spoken, I have come that I may demarcate the protection of the lady of the house Cenibet. Again, we're in an elevated social uh, sphere. Uh, so uh, lady of the house implies um, uh, that she's in a family of some means. Uh, holding the unk sign. I'd like you to remember this figure. I'm giving you a lot of things to remember. I'd like you to remember this uh, figure uh, as well of the woman holding uh, the unk sign. And then maybe here, that's the tip at the top over the crack of a wasp scepter. So she's holding two very specific things. They're telling us what is happening. Her protection comes with was, the was scepter, the ancient Egyptian word for power, dominion, and anach, the ankh circle in her other hand, um, denoting life. And on the other side, the full side, you can see again another series of figures. So this is a kind of an upturned task. It's a, it's a pectoral rather than, a, it's doing something which is inspired maybe from the same idea of imagery, but it's a really remarkable standalone, an ancient standalone. I think this is entirely authentic. It's an ancient product, um, but it's very difficult to use this to explain the other things that we're looking at directly. It's one apart. You find that very often in art history. This is a, a creation without immediate parallels. If we go back to the main corpus, you find these things are being used. They're not made for the tomb. They're being used. So on the left, there's a figure that's almost been wiped out completely. You can just see the head of the serval, the wild savanna cat, and on the right, behind the rather more crudely cut, long-eared animal head, you should be able to make out between its ears a knife. And then below is another of those neb baskets. And then above the upper ear, on the upper edge, you see the triangular edge of the head of a toad. So someone has decided that toad does not go there. We are going to change this. Is that because they broke or rubbed down the edge, needed to recarve it? Something has changed in the life of this object. This is very important because the life of the object is the ancient lives of the people we're trying to understand and connect with. So here you need to know that for them it was important enough to change the image, to adapt the piece. And it's important also to listen to the inscriptions on that minority of examples. This um, from Licht again is an inscription that specifies the protection is going to go around or behind the Egyptian pronoun ha'a is ambiguous, it can either be behind someone or perhaps more enveloping. Um, and the protection is specifically of seneb, health, and anach, life. So slightly different to the message of power and life before. We should look out for these differences. And once there's an order, direct order on the back of this tusk where someone orders the figures to cut off the head of the enemy, male or female, who would enter this chamber of the children born to Nebet Sechet Ra. -a. You can interpret that in many ways. Maybe Nebet Sechet Ra is pregnant, but has not yet had children. Maybe they have not yet named the children. Maybe it's simply referring to the children in general rather than in future. But the action is very direct. The knives and the hands of the figures are to cut off enemies perceived as snakes. 
So one last example of the inscription. I've slipped now into the purchased items, but again from quite a long time ago. This was in the Hood collection um, and the Anastasi collection. So these are 1850s acquisitions and uh, the middle piece is now in New York and the side pieces are in the Louvre. Again, a magnificent example of cutting and carving. If you're looking out for those lines, of the commissure that I showed you on the Petri Tusk at the beginning, you won't find them. But here we have um, a more explicit statement. On the left, all of the figures speak and they're called the numerous protections. Words spoken by the numerous protections. We have come to demarcate our protection of life around or behind the lady of the house, Lady Senebeth. On the right, it's spoken by a single figure. So is that figure in the middle? And look at his head, baboon head, cynocephalus head. Uh, maybe that's like our doubtful tusk example. Um, here he's claiming I am the bearer of the Wedjat eye. The Wedjat is the eye gone out from Horus or gone out from Ra and in returning back to the divine body becomes whole again, the whole body becomes whole, more healthy than the healthy body had been, the restored eye. So this is also a motif connected with Hathor returning as the Nile flood from the desert or from Nubia. So these motifs are making sense within the thinking of the time, and it remains to see what are the kinds of objects they occur on. So uh, we have little feeding cups, one provenanced from Licht, same series, little turtle at the front, and then these same specific features. We have an unprovenanced example, may or may not be ancient, but it has the same uh, figures, and on the underside, a snaking uh, figure it seems to be in keeping with the ancient production. And then we have this steatite rod, a different type of wielding of power, it would seem, not quite sure how you would hold it, whether you just put it down on the ground, not much room to hold anything on these, but that would be a good candidate for experimental archeology. span um, This is not provenance, often ascribed to Materia, uh, ancient Heliopolis, Maybe it's in fact a stray from Licht, who, who can tell? It's not uh, an excavated piece, but it is extremely remarkable. It has one parallel from excavation found outside Egypt in Byblos, which had many connections, Byblos, the port in Lebanon. So here you have many of the same figures. You could fit them all onto uh, a, a Tusk figure series without any problem. The baboon, the servo, the crocodile. But you don't have some things, there's an absence. You don't have the hippopotamus lion, the most common motif, or the griffin, or that long-necked feline. So you only have the animals you could see around you, but not the animals that you could sense around you. The parallels to individual motifs confirm the popularity within this 1850, 1700 BC time span. Uh, and particularly the hippopotamus lion and the frontal figure. These are the two who really um, uh, stand out, um, but often with variations. So you have like a child version. This is the other side of that Licht fragment I so showed earlier. Um, you do also find that in a less leonine faced form in a group from Sigmund. And then we have the human head floating between the wings or emerging from the wings on the back of the falcon headed um, feline with this very vicious butcher's knife. So those kinds of figures are much rarer. And in fact, you have to go to Beni Hassan to the famous desert hunt scene for the governor Shim Hotep. I hope you can see at the top in the middle, an example, beautifully painted, beautiful photograph from the Nagi um, Kanawati uh, Macquarie Beni Hassan Dictionary Project. I'll put the um, URL there if you want to look that up if you haven't seen it before. It's a wonderful uh, resource. We're in this area where some of those figures are familiar, but others are not. The carnivores you find on the tusks, but you don't find um, these herbivores. You don't often find anything bovid and you don't find the small 
um, creatures either. You could quite easily have fitted them in, and the painter here has, but not on the task. They're not there to do this task. But we find out here they are. And I'd like you to look at how this animal is lowering its head. So you need to talk to animal behaviour experts, not to an Egyptologist or philologist like me, but in general terms, when an animal has its head down like that, um, you see it in this beautiful example again from Licht, um, the, the, the griffin and the leopard here, they're prowling. They're, they're, they're about to attack, they're about to kill something. You're just exactly at that moment you would be in the moment before the flood. What will happen next? So go to your natural history pictures and reabsorb the message of the ancient tasks from the way the animals behave. There's an acute observation of nature in these pieces. Well, to round off, I'd like to look at some of the um, figure series that show both when that spirit of the tasks is still present and when it stops and what it is replaced by. So on the right, you have an example where it's still clearly the frontal figure, but maybe other things are beginning to come in as well. This is an object in the uh, collection of the Museo Gizio. Uh, the province is not known, but it was in the collection by 1882. And on the left, you have two parallels from excavations at Abydos. So you have um, on the far left, um, an item um, with a very fine glaze and the uh, uh, one in the middle there uh, is from the um, uh, same cemetery, but it has a different style. It's open work, like the example in Turin. So when you look at them a little bit more closely, uh, particularly looking at the glaze, get a sense of that glazed um, effect, and this kind of shimmering effect, you can see many of the features on the one at far left, um, which relate to Hathor, the Hathor symbol itself. Um, and then the branch here, so coming back to our flowers, um, a hunting dog, the unseen. Um, and there was the hare, so we're getting these herbivores. It's a different landscape. Here's an ibex. It's a hunting scene. Herbivores are being hunted, and there are plants around. So another example, again from a perch is said to be from Thebes, but it has the name of Amenhotep in, in a style found under Amenhotep I. So we think we're already at 1500 BC here, and we have that funny marsh-like motif atop, and we do have one of these odd um, sets of branches, but here is a, as a tree, uh, along with caprids. So a rather different landscape. And the coal vases, you can follow sort of the typology, quite close in time may be, but one world of protection is handing over to another. The horror of the eve of the flood is giving way to the festival of Hattor. For me, the question is, why were they not doing both at the same time? Why do you not in the Middle Kingdom also not have the Hathor festival? Where is Hathor at this time? Is she completely encapsulated in queenship? What is, what is happening uh, at that time? But at some point, not only does the Hathor series arrive or return, but also this fierce set disappears or recedes. The little circle on the right is perhaps part of that Hathor motif, all these little running hairs, but you do still have the baboon and the falcon. We can go through the collections and just think, are you dealing with Hathor and the festival of the new year, or are you dealing with Sechnet and the dread of disease just before the waters begin to rise, bringing either redemption or uh, catastrophe. So those New Year motifs are already very clear earlier. The exuberant festivity of the dancing figures on third millennium, so late Old Kingdom material, sometimes even with the emphasis, the Heru Nefa, the happy day, the festival, uh, the Renpet Nefa, the happy year. So the new year, um, and here also with a fish, something else we've not seen on the tusks. Different world, this is before the tusks, uh, which you find also on the seal amulets. So you could think of this as dancing with Hathor, something very exuberant. And I think it was Dorothea Arnold in her Egyptian bestiary, which is fortunately online for us all to enjoy 
through the Metropolitan Museum publication site, that you get the connection between art, theme, ecology most clearly. And that's what I would try to do, both with the tusks and with the sets of images around them. You can create strings, not only by putting one figure after another within a single composition, but also by stringing them together with amulets. So here is an example we might just check. This is a body of a young woman adorned in Gao in the period uh, between the Old and Middle Kingdom, around about 2100 BC. And you can see she had, according to the excavator, two sets of uh, amulets, two strings, one of gold, little ankh signs, crowns, and our hippopotamus lion friend, the later Tawaret, Ipi of the Middle Kingdom, Reru, on the tusks. And here she has a much uh, more difficult set of uh, figures maybe to identify, um, but you might be able to make out not just the figures of dread, uh, the vulture, but also they're a little bit upside down here. Um, but this is the Hathor face, and this is He, the god holding the plant. So you can just separate them out. You can put all of the tusk motifs on one side, and you can just see which items are not present on the tusk um, on the other. So you don't have so much crowns. Or, or you could argue you have the Ankh present in the inscriptions, but these other figures of humans have been largely missing and the Hathor face, this is something different, slightly different mixed message world. Whereas um, on the other side, all of these motifs we have seen. If you move a little bit later, just a hundred years later, the precision you can get in these uh, single burials of the third millennium, you find that the tusk motifs are much more dominant. This is a group on a necklace, uh, again on the body of a woman, here we think already in the early Middle Kingdom, around 2000 BC, and all of those items, they would fit the wedge atai, um, these animal-headed uh, figures. Maybe that's the lion-headed uh, crocodile, uh, sorry, the hippopotamus lion, what am I saying? Here's the crocodile, um, and the falcons. So raptors and powers, which are uh, can be vicious. But just on one item, there's a little bird with a fantail. It doesn't seem to fit into that picture. Maybe that's something we should think of when we look at the problem task. So you have, in terms of Dorothea Arnold, your fauna of the high desert, and then you have your desert edge. But within that, you have choices. On the high desert in the 18th dynasty, they show um, the plant eaters, the herbivores, but they didn't do that on the tusks. And it's also at the marsh edge. You can show fish, but they didn't do that. You can show plants, but they didn't do that in the Tusk series. Go forward to the early 18th dynasty, the jury of Ahote, all of these racing animals. Some of them are found, but so many of them are not. The birds and the ibex again. Uh, it's a different concept. So come back to the dominant motif in the series, powerful image from Lahoon on the right, sometimes very schematic. That one in the middle from Lahoon, Middle Kingdom, makes me think that this potentially pre purchased piece, maybe that's also meant to be um, the um, uh, this hippopotamus lion force, uh, later called Tawaret, but called in the tusks, Rer, perhaps Reret, uh, the sow. So here's that from a Scaparelli purchase now in the Egyptian Museum in Turin, um, that, that might be part of this picture. And in later times, uh, the, the image is more formalized and something not just to the annual flood or the daily birth of the sun, but also to the birth of a person. You're moving towards horoscope at this point, but this is a thousand years later. Um, and in that systematic elaboration, if you go into the Ptolemaic adaptation of the Hathor shrine at al Bakri, you can find the um, uh, 12 months. There's a different form in each of these shrines uh, inside the shrine of the birth goddess. Here with a lioness head, um, and here maybe not so prominent as here. They're, 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 they're finding points of distinction. So I'd like to look for the tusk form in action, in depictions. You may know these images from Elkab 
and Daryl Bauscher from the either end of the uh, late Middle Kingdom, Elkab from the late end, Daryl Bauscher from the mid 12th dynasty. Here at um, Elkab, you have this chapel of a man called Bebi in the second intermediate period stretch of the tombs and chapels along the river cliff edge and here in the close-up you can see how with the governor while well, he's a commander maybe he was the governor of al um, and his wife and his daughters at the back I hope you can see at the right edge the two women at right are holding in one hand a snake staff and in the other a uh, boomerang shape which may be uh, tusks so this is here for the protection, uh, it seems, of uh, the women of the family, but maybe it's also for the men. Uh, here, it's more strongly gendered with the women. You have the example of uh, Belsha, the procession of the family of the governor in the now very heavily destroyed uh, chapel at Dera Belsha. Um, this is in Middle Egypt. And here the um, figures on the right partially destroyed are the ones you need to look at more closely because in the upper right of the old line drawing, you can see someone holding again a boomerang. So here's the close up uh, and in the middle, right in the middle of this slide, beside greeting the famous um, block, which is now in the British Museum collection, so very often reproduced, uh, you can see that above the woman who's holding the flail and above another woman who's holding a diagonal tusk in a hand in a greeting ceremony. Again, protective. Atit here is the word for a dry nurse. Menat is the wet nurse. So these are women around the family of the governor who have specific tasks to do. And in the governor um, Jehudi Nach's uh, coffin. Again, you see over the bed, above the horizontally laying headrest, the right side of the bed, um, you find another of these images. So we're very much in the world of sleeping, of resting, of lying down, and therefore potential danger, and also under the bed with snake staves at either end, um, in a scene of depiction of the production from the uh, treasuries of the army. If we go underground, so we stay underground with the coffins, but if we really go underground, um, then you find in the Book of Two Ways something similar happening. You have these um, monsters, we might call them protectors, here protecting Osiris and stopping anyone get through. You have to get past them. So they hold knives too. Some of them look a little bit like the figures on the Tusk series, but it's not that collective. It's just an overlap, I would say. So those particular forces are divided in the later, the New Kingdom tradition, into guards, reporters and keepers in the Book of the Dead, chapter 144. Always remember that the numbering of the Book of the Dead is simply Lepsius from the famous papyrus in the Museo Egizio in Turin. So this is on that papyrus of the Ankh and Ptolemaic period, exactly this set of guardians with their different shapes of head. You will find some tusk motifs in there, but they won't all fit into that collective. So protecting the underworld, protecting the individual, protecting Osiris, there are overlaps, but they're still not quite what I would call the tusk figure series. We could do one last uh, entry. I realise the time is going on, but we could do one last foray into the Valley of the Kings itself. Um, and here, just find how the, um, the imagery might still live on, uh, where you might still, in the 15th century BC, see the tradition from the Middle Kingdom. This is the Amduat. Egyptologists have rows over, have massive arguments over what date this should be. Is it from the time of the New Kingdom or is it a recreation of a Middle Kingdom or who knows, even earlier set of compositions? And the question maybe is when did it come into a visual form out of these um, images? And until we find a Middle Kingdom papyrus, it'd be difficult to resolve that argument. But the very first hour, the very first figure in front of the boat, the sun god who's moving into the night 
to be reunited with the body of Osiris to emerge again the next day is also holding one of these boomerang shapes. And he's called um, the one who traverses the hours and the um, figure uh, behind him, a snake, maybe not a snake's staff, but a snake on its tail um, seems to be um, an hour or a star itself. So it will be very interesting to see what the most recent book by Hartwig Hartmüller proposes in relation to the wider set of underworld imagery. Um, there may also in the third hour be uh, the same object resting, but now turn the other way up, if it is indeed um, one of these worked hippo tusk shapes from Middle Kingdom style. In the late period and Ptolemaic period, they still show the Amduat sometimes, but the boomerang shaped object has turned into a scroll. So this is in the um, collection at uh, Windsor Castle, at least I'm not sure if it's kept there, but it's in um, the Windsor collection. And the uh, front figure here, you can see clearly on their excellent website, um, um, shows uh, the crosser of the hours still, Ja Wenut, um, and the Seba, now also called Imen, the hidden one, the serpent. Um, but the idea of the boomerang shape, um, the old work to us, isn't, isn't alive anymore. And that in Egypt is important to know when things stop being visible or making sense. From Alton Miller, I will notice this further overlap with the ascension figures from the Valley of the Kings, famous from tombs of um, Seti and um, Tutankhamun. So here you do have that liminal space. You see the leopard again, um, but you see alongside it the harpuna, something we did not have in the, uh, on, on the Tusk figure series. And these have a different job. It's still to do with Hathor as a celestial goddess here, but it's to move the king up into the uh, upper sphere from the tomb and to be able to come back. And this is beautifully explained by Altamilla in his uh, article uh, on the papyrus thicket on the desert. So this is where there is an overlap because the king has to cross that liminal space but the tusks seem to remain within that liminal space and just on the side of the leopard. Um, there's a further underground group I'd like to mention because in the Turin Museum, you have that wonderful set of fragments that Ankatrin Gill has published where you can see exactly the same figures. Um, presumably this is into the Ptolemaic period again, um, evoking the circle of guardians we know in three dimensions from the tombs of the kings. In the British Museum, there was a series, perhaps on the tomb of Horam Hebs, so just after the Amarna period. These are some of the same fauna, but only in part. So you have the turtle, but now on a human head. There's wonderful contorted figures. You can see them moving round. They're like automata, guarding the sarcophagus of the king. And they are kept guarding the body on the late period series here on the sarcophagus of Sebahanut from Tarnas, 11th century BC. So here you have again the idea of guardianship. The tusks are more specific. They're not doing the same thing exactly in the same space. They're protecting, they're guarding, they're fighting, but something different is going on. Maybe you get closest to it in the papyrus of Mutatetu. Um, so that's that last uh, item I'd like to show here from the parallels. Um, I'll now just at uh, the bottom here. You can see at the top you have different figures um, shaking the lizard, but at the bottom it's serpents and knives. And the uh, uh, group at the bottom right, um, underneath the body and to the bottom right corner, you can see maybe these come out of uh, a uh, 11th century BC Egyptian with the experience of maybe had seen one of those tusks and reproduces something like it to protect the sleeping body of the noble mummified dead uh, lady Mutatepti. Authenticity, to round off. Martin Fitton writes wonderful volume on authenticity from seven years ago. Um, 
was brave enough to put the finger on this problem. The Fits and Writers series is very inspirational again for uh, touching on all the main themes of scientific interest in Egyptology and in wider archaeology over the last uh, dozen years and more. And from this volume, um, we have a reminder that authenticity has always been a problem in Egyptology. Back to the time of uh, the Roman encounter with Egypt, I would guess. So in the 19th and early 20th century, people are worried all of the time about how much of the material they're buying was made yesterday. And this is the best known um, documentation to an extent of examples circulating on the market um, by Wakeling in 1912, where um, that set I've put in the middle at the top are cut in bone. And you can see what quality of workmanship. So again, into, in order to assess authenticity, you need to know what people could do. You need to see how good the makers are and how bad they were on every detail. So when you have a set of cross lines, as in those um, Sons of Horus numbered one, two, four, and five at the top, you can think, hmm, right? We can see a nice polish. If you could track them down even better, I don't know whether anyone has this collection from Wakeling, be good to see photographs of the objects he's describing, but that would allow you a chance to compare directly with the Tuscan, the Petrie Museum, and with the Tuscan Chicago, because that's a slightly better documented example purchased in Luxor. Doesn't mean it was made in Luxor, purchased in, in uh, Luxor in 1920. And here again, you have some figures which are wrapped, which is why I draw it here as a parallel, entirely different style, except that the man and the um, maybe uh, hippopotamus lion figure, uh, Taweret or Reret, um, they seem to be very closely thought of together with, with the vultures. But otherwise, very different treatment of the branches, which are a single stem, um, and the flower, which seems to be more of a wheat sheaf on the Chicago item. It's useful to look at these together, and particularly to look at the bit which is not figurative, but just the lines at the right end of each of them and start comparing those. I would also look at the patina, which worries me, I have to say, with the Petrie piece. I haven't seen the Chicago object uh, in, uh, directly for myself, so I can only really talk about the Petrie one. But maybe um, this is all ancient. Maybe it is an ancient piece which was plain, and then someone on what I would say is the wrong side has decided to put a set of figures, and again, the wrong way up on the long outer edge, which otherwise we only saw on the collar, in the ivory collar of the British Museum. So maybe there is that early 20th century mark of uh, second hand. But we should still check. We should check with Daphne Bentor's catalogue of scarabs to see how similar the branches are to what we can see in archaeology at Tel Adaba in the 18th century BC. Maybe it's just a very late Middle Kingdom, second intermediate period to us. We can look at the papyrus motif in the center of a nice symmetrical hieroglyph uh, scarab from Licht. These are excavated pieces. We can, we can think with them. We can look at a wider range of uh, branches on the uh, Levantine scarabs produced in uh, Palestine in the 17th, 16th century BC. And Krista Molina has done the most wonderful work in tracking exactly where each of those come from. So you have an idea where their weight of production is likely to have been, maybe particularly in Tel Ajul as the sister city in the trade from Egypt to uh, West Asia, um, the sister to Tel Adaba on the Nile Delta side. So we shouldn't forget that we have documented examples of modern copies. So the top from the Welcome Collection fits into the documented series beautifully. It's one of the most beautiful examples I know. Um, we have a very schematic writing of the word for night and at the break, the word for day. Um, so you have this idea of protecting through the 12 hours of night and day. And then bottom uh, from the Tauru White Collection, collected about the same time, but it's been copied from the one on top. And the magnificent upturned tusk collar shape now in the British Museum I showed you earlier was also 
acquired at the same time that Oxford acquired a wooden painted copy. So copies were something people did, and it's important to look at those. And we just look at the other types of objects, the banding on the figures. Maybe we should be looking at uh, Jose Galan's uh, amazing series of discoveries in Puerto de Ruti, in uh, Gerardo Nega, um, and uh, also from the early excavations by the Metropolitan, uh, plenty of examples where you can chase through um, the way that patterning is done, the way that spaces are filled out. So it's the ring that goes around from the vulture legs out left and right, you get that same kind of triangular banding you find on this difficult task. So I'll leave this as a task for the future. Here in London, to look more carefully with Anna Garnett, the curator of the Petrie Museum, at how this was made. Could it be an ancient item? Is the cutting of the line at the end similar to the cutting of the body? But above all, uh, my last slide, to come back to Turin and to look carefully at the coffin in the gallery of Elysia, which is where I first saw it and uh, I was so struck by it. It's so uh, outrageous. It was placed, I think, maybe in the Nubian gallery as something evocative of, um, of that um, slightly other placeness. It had a label with a question mark. I'm very grateful to colleagues in Turin for clarifying the question mark is um, important. Uh, the question mark suggested it might be from Gao, but that seems to be impossible um, from the sequence of numbers and the number that they had been attributed to this object, uh, in fact, uh, I'm told, uh, belongs to um, a well-identified ceramic vessel, so a completely different object. Nevertheless, I would like to come back to this because the details are so intriguing. There's so much right and wrong in it. The woman on the uh, side of the band, just like the woman in the Tusk of Cenobet. So maybe that's where the painter saw it. Maybe the coffin is fine, but someone just got enthusiastic filling in. And yet I can't find any part of that decoration where the line of the first artist in ancient times would have been handed over to the line of the modern. It seems to be of a piece. It's a very fascinating item. And I'd like to end with uh, another little homage to Kasich Bukowska, whose work on the demons of ancient Egypt has been such uh, important inspiration for any of us working on ancient Egyptian literature, in ancient Egyptian religion. And um, you'll notice on this um, painted exterior that the figure of the not much left to her, but she is still in some sense rer, reret, ipi, tawaret, the hippopotamus lion force, the most popular motif on the tusks. Um, she doesn't just have these reed shaped knives in her front paws, her upper um, limbs, but also in the lower, her, what look like her legs here, rather than her arms. Of course, she's meant to be a quadruped, so it's upper and lower. The hind legs, they're perched on top of the foot, and I'd love to hear from Cassia whether she thinks this is one of her feet of fury, just around the Amarna period. I'm in hot at the third, early um, 19th dynasty, and then particularly emphatic form of showing Bez uh, and few other uh, protectors of women, children, men, uh, the order of the world. Um, uh, they're not just uh, with arms in the, in the front, but also on their feet, more or less like hieroglyphs rather than as weapons. It shows the knife is coming. The action of severing is about to happen. So this is how you have to read Egyptian art. She showed how in those other images of theirs, you can uh, track in the late 18th dynasty, how a dance is being performed, steps of a dance. There's some which you have there's squatting in front of you, some with a dancing profile, and some leaning on the hieroglyph for protection. So it's a three-step dance, like the Hakka dance. It's a performance of aggression to protect a vulnerable person. And that's exactly what the Tusks do, but they don't have quite this strategy. So is this a step in that direction, or is this pair of knives on the goddess an indication that someone more recently has let their imagination loose with ancient Egyptian imagery? 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for this uh, amazing uh, overview that you gave uh, us not only about tasks, but also about uh, the figures that are represented, uh, represented as uh, guardians and the use that uh, they can be made of in many different uh, objects, texts, uh, going from the Amduat, uh, starting from the Middle Kingdom tombs, uh, ending up with um, uh, the Coffinin um, Turing. Uh, it's really amazing. And I mean, after your lecture, uh, I really want uh, whether the example in London and in Chicago are uh, original tasks, or uh, it would be very interesting to see your or your findings uh, when you can check whether the, the cutting on the lines uh, on the edge are the si similar to the rest, and whether um, what, what will be your your final analysis. Um, I have a question that goes a little bit slightly off. Um, the topic of tasks, uh, and I would like to, to, to come to the uh, coffin in Turing. Uh, and it's more a question to you as a profound, uh, um, to your profound knowledge of ancient Egyptian material culture, and your knowledge and all the issues you, you put also on authenticity. Um, because uh, uh, maybe it might sound a very naive question. But my question is, what would inspire somebody to make a coffin, which is so weird to, to look at the very beginning? Uh, I mean, if you want to make a forgery, if you want to produce a fake, uh, and, and if you want to uh, be sure that you can sell it somehow on, on the antiquity markets and so you can also earn some money, why would you do something so weird to start with? Uh, that, you, you know, once you see it, you start doubting altogether from the very beginning. When would you not try to do something that you might be more successful with uh, in more traditional way of decorating? I think that's a really, um, that really hits the, the nail on the head with any kind of question of authenticity. Um, what does the maker want to do? Um, that takes you to who the maker is. And um, usually I agree with you, there should be a general conformity. Um, people will do quite banal things. They'll add a cartouche or they will um, put in, and then usually that's where they go wrong because the style will usually catch them out or just be too interesting, like most of the Gertzel of additions to the Michaelides collection, where uh, it's very exciting to add a, um, an inscription that solves the length of reign of Horam Heb and the question of whether he invaded Syria in one inscription. But people will look at that very closely. And it only was a matter of a few years before, um, after the, the first publication, um, that that was, was dismissed. Um, on the other hand, there is also what Pascal Venus, I think, has drawn attention to is the um, um, and also Henry Fisher to an extent, uh, does the scholarly um, input. So very often uh, people are trained not only in art, which is uh, one big motivation to the production of fakes, just being able to make material. Um, so when the schools of art open, um, they, they are very useful for the production of material. Also when schools of restoration open, uh, these are major centers, some of the worst cases of um, um, uh, adaptation in England, ruining of ancient objects were done by, uh, just one or two instances here, um, by uh, conservators, people who wanted to enhance. Um, on the other hand, in past generations, sometimes the enhancing was part of the production of a new meaning. So. Uh, it's like any of a terrible, is he doing something terrible or is this part of a different ideology where you are uh, creating something which does make sense in its own time? Some of the speculations of uh, Kirsha may be in, in the same area. So uh, here there is something very exuberant, whether it's ancient or modern, it's a wonderful piece. It's a very important piece because it will lead us to the source of that exuberance. If we can pin down the date at which it happened, we might have uh, a better idea. But there is something um, to be 
discovered with each of the motifs. So what, what needs to happen with this coffin in Turin is, is to take every single motif and just to think about it in isolation, exactly as they are on the tusks. But then also as with the tusks, to think about how they're fitting together. If you go through the inscription, you've probably done this yourself. Um, of course, the inscription is full of um, disastrous mistakes, but no worse than the Yurudef uh, material from uh, uh, Sagara or, um, or, or from probably my own hieroglyphs in my first year, or maybe even later um, in, in class. It was uh, a natural progression. It is a natural progression to, to experiment. And I think we overestimate the ease with which people could write. So when you're the first person told to create a monument, think of the first Timidic period monuments, first person to make a hieroglyphic inscription in your town, uh, how, what resources do you draw on? I think uh, the late uh, Jan Blomhead uh, sadly passed away at the beginning of this year um, in, uh, in his work on African linguistics about what literacy means is the kind of question. We're looking at a kind of a, not only a hieroglyphic literacy, but a motif literacy and what it means to adapt these things and which circumstances that happen. Underlying our resistance to an identification of an object as a modern piece is the idea that it was made for money, I think. So there's this sacred line in academic study, we should not be doing things for money, it should only be for science. And at some point, um, we, we need to confront that taboo uh, more directly and just understand how involved science always is in, in the economy and uh, how uh, people are always, Petrie, he was giving advice to museums in Brooklyn, in uh, Copenhagen, and he, he was purchasing on a massive scale for Brooklyn for the Fitzwilliam. So th th there's never such an easy line, uh, particularly in the early 20th century when it was legal to uh, export antiquities. So I think you need, it will be a matter, I mean, for example, we're looking straight at now in the middle of the slide, those five little figures crouching like a kind of a, a naughty graffito, you know, that they're so reminiscent of some of the smaller drawings in one of the two uh, coffin texts with the, the Book of Two Ways has uh, drawings. There are only two, and one of them, uh, these little figures, I mean, they, they, they kind of jump out at you and you think, uh, or, or as the woman jumped out at me there, they, they, they suggest things to you. And then the next step is to think, what is the distance from that? And then that's not a chronological question at the beginning. It's a question of concept again. So what, what was the maker trying to do? And then I think you might find even within the kind of semi-scholarly, uh, semi-commercial basis, someone might produce exuberance. Perhaps we should have uh, a kind of a museum meeting on um, exuberance in the collections to find out where and why people make well, uh, why, why, While you're answering, I was uh, just thinking a, a very inspiring article of yours that I've been reading in the past few months, uh, The Magic of Material Reception of Ancient Egypt and their impacts in the nice volume of uh, Miguel John Fuss lives uh, on the um, uh, and, and you know uh, reading your article together with uh, the article at the beginning of uh, Jan Asman uh, it made me and talking about museum realize more and more how the history of memory and construction of memory and the idea of Egypt that we construct in museum should be also part I mean we should be more aware of uh, of the construction of a kind of Egypt that we make in museum. Uh, well, if I might quote Finley, using a, an abusing material or other original or of forgery. So uh, it's very interesting indeed. Um, I look at the chat. There are uh, some questions for you. Um, uh, the first one. Thank you for this amazing lecture. I would like to ask you. How were you able to investigate these objects and, and to continue your research activity during this year of pandemic? Uh, <laughs> maybe I stopped sharing at that moment. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Well, on one side, 
Um, I would say um, this is the best moment. This is really a moment of extremity. What else are the tusks about? It's, it's an extremis. We are all suddenly plunged in extremis. And um, we, we suddenly can open our eyes. We can't sit in our armchairs. Uh, we can't comfortably go to excavation. We can't uh, meet colleagues uh, around the world. Uh, and the digital world is wonderful for also bringing us together so often. But uh, we're dealing with, um, I would say, dealing with uh, Egypt, it's, uh, as in many things, it's not enough. You know, it's, it's, uh, you just feel uh, cheated of not being able to be there all the time. So you have this um, disjunction between um, what you would like to do, what you regularly do, which is me to come to Turin and give a talk and answer the people in person and study the object, look at the registers. The registers are always very undervalued. I think I would love to follow through always the, the paper trail of the curator. I think that's so important as well as trying to look at the object, an ancient maker, and do, do objects with bands at the end that have figures on them, for example, anciently. The, these kind of um, meticulous Dorothea Arnold, Christine Lilliquist questions, the people who really look, the Metropolitan, such a powerhouse for uh, looking at the detail, looking at the object, but also um, we, we need to um, show the inventories more. It's been such a delight since the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris put online the inventaire uh, de Boulac, where you can see, you can't see how the museum collection changed after Mariette died, the Journal d'Entrée is in Cairo, but you can follow through. So I would say um, in these 16 grim months of an unending agony for the Nile to finally come, and let's hope it doesn't overwhelm us, uh, I, I, we, we each of us have a, 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 a duty to find the productive part of that and to reconnect with um, the parts we wouldn't otherwise have looked at. Yeah, I'm sure yourself, Christine, you know, I, I, I'm reading things I would never have read. My eyes are about to give way completely. I'm sure I won't be able to see after the pandemic, but um, it is also discovery. So many museums, uh, including uh, you know, this series you have for Museo Gizio, have put so many new resources. The Ministry, Haudelineni, put so many new um, tours of, of sites I've never seen and probably will never manage to see, the virtual tours. Um, we can um, study, but we can't use the library, at least in London. We can't. I, I have my own books at home, but uh, yeah, li library. That ordinary library work is suspended. I can ask for a book, but uh, until some point in the future in London, it's so that has changed. Um, I don't know how you found it yourself. Uh, the, the, this kind of you have to make a really conscious, positive adjustment. Think this is what I can do, and then you get overwhelmed by everything else. But it's. <laughs> Well, first of all, we managed to reopen the library. I uh, was very happy indeed. We uh, were closed in the first lockdown, then we reopened in the summer, and we have been opened ever since. Uh, of course, only a few people can come. Uh, then the same scholar can reuse the same books. If other scholars want to use the books, the books have to be kept apart for a few a few days before, before they can be reused. But this has been a huge huge um, effort for us but also huge help for students and uh, so that they could proceed you know in their thesis and a PhD I heard or some PhD programs that have been extended by six months okay. so that the student can catch up but you know with a, a specialized Egyptological library it's very difficult to set up a system of loans because mm -hmm. You might need, uh, I don't know, the lexicon of lights, or yeah, you might yeah. need um, excavation report, and uh, and then as you need, somebody else could need it as well, and will be very. Yeah, complicated. Every point needs ten other things. I hear the library staff have been; they just worked miracles through the whole 15, 16 months. Uh, so the UCL library store and in the Petrie Museum as well, uh, you know, the, the lengths to which people have gone, so our students have been given access to objects to a certain extent as far as Anna could provide. Um, so it's, it has been really heartening, inspirational, I would say again, how much people have done. But um, we are all looking forward to the end of it and returning to the traveling yes. if uh, that will be possible and uh, returning to the library. That will be in answer to the question, um, the, the biggest disjuncture, just having to think, 
Library's not there. What are the other resources? What can I learn? It made us aware, though, to uh, in understanding different things. Um, uh, uh, for instance, the extent of time also. Uh, I remember when I was a student uh, reading about the Asiatic disease and the pandemic that developed in Egypt in the 14th century BC and reading it lasted for 20 years without realizing what it really meant or could mean for life of people. And now this made us realize what it means to have restrictions, to be confined, to not be able to be free moving and as we were discussing just before your lecture, also the word all in a sudden appears to be very big again, and you're not able to go from one place to another. There is another question, which is in Italian. I, well, I know that you perfectly read Italian, uh, uh, but uh, if you want me to, to, uh, to give a quick translation, it's about tasks uh, seen as particular objects compared to other funerary objects. Uh, and there are uh, of... Uh, um, they did a lo uh, last for a long period, for, but rather for a short period. Why, according to you, uh, they develop in a, a particular historical period and why they didn't uh, develop during the old diachronical development of the ancient Egyptian civilization? Hmm. Can you run that one past me again? That was quite uh, um, involved. If you just uh... So if you just say, um, uh, why uh, why uh, they were used for a limited period of time and why they developed in, in the period in which they developed and then didn't carry on in the ancient Egyptian tradition? So I think it is um, it is a big question. And uh, I, I mentioned during the talk, why, why did they not just have uh, if we want to give them the names of Hathor and Sekhmet, uh, the kind of the flip side of the, um, of, of the goddess, um, Hathor providing festivity and Sekhmet bringing danger. Why didn't they have Hathor and Sekhmet series alongside one another and use them for different things? Maybe it's also partly here. We have to remember um, there was a long tradition in Egyptology of thinking anything connected with magic had to be something lesser. Um, magic had a, um, a negative uh, connotation. I try to avoid using the word at all because it's about people engaging with natural forces of power, with forces of the world of power and doing it in different ways. Um, but I think the, 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 the tusks, they were called wands before, they were called salbermesser, so magical knives. Um, there's some idea of sorcery in that. And that encouraged people not to recognize how perfectly formed, how, how, how it just essentially beautiful they are. If you, if you take each individual image out and there it is in its own little bubble, its own space, um, they, they're, they're the finest and there are many of them are really remarkable works. Um, so the formulation we should expect perhaps because it's coming with such sophistication, we should expect it to be tied to a particular point. I'll give you two possible answers. One would be to go, in fact, in the direction you mentioned, epidemiology. You would think of it um, a bit of like in uh, David Wengrow's book, Origin of Monsters. You'd, you'd think of, there might be moments where um, you, you really want to block the entry of any dangerous uh, force. And at those specific moments, there will be an intense concentration just on that, um, that particular set of motifs. So if you like, you'll have more segment, it will be necessary to, to, to focus uh, on that. And maybe Ta and Almu, I think Gerdeke was arguing at one point that this would all come from the second intermediate period, that not only the Hyksos, but some ghastly disease would arrive from, um, from the East. And uh, maybe that had a resonance in the Eurocentric reception of, uh, um, of uh, that general concept of East-West um, dichotomies. So um, that would be an interesting thing to explore. Maybe there was more um, contact at a certain point and maybe that did bring health crises. There is another option. Um, I've sort of attempted to investigate that, but I, 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 um, if I put my hand on my heart, I don't think that is the direction uh, that will turn out to be productive. Um, the other option is that we're dealing with a production that starts around kingship, maybe not for kingship. Um, we don't find anything like this in the um, the burials of the daughters of the king, the famous treasures of Dashur and Lahun. Um, 
but maybe in around that, not far from that, there is a formulation, a perfect, beautiful hieroglyphic formulation uh, for the protection of life that is tied very much to either synods at the first, at the founding of Ichitawi, or at the reconfirmation of it under synods at the third. Depends a bit on how you would put the desert hunt scene where you would date that in Daryl Bersha in the, um, sorry, in Beni Hassan in the, uh, um, in the uh, uh, Shinim Hotep uh, desert hunt painting. So I, I wonder whether, as well as thinking about Hator and Sechmet, maybe in Egyptology we should think more also about the concentrations of power. That means thinking about the history of Egypt as uh, city states almost, uh, as the places, as, as the cities, as the not necessarily large cities, which Tawi may never have been more than a, a fortification, but uh, maybe there is something about what is going on in the Memphite area, as opposed to Tel Adaba. Certainly the Second Intermediate Period plays out, not only as a, a series of blocks of kingdoms fighting, but also as the history of three cities, Thebes, Memphis, and, um, and, and Tel Adaba, Avaris. So maybe there is something connected with constellations of royal power um, that change the way things are being formulated at the palace, that this is a, an effect. Maybe it's not a part of that royal idea, but maybe it's a, a, a part of the effect. And the only place we find that Wesser uh, emblem, which is on the tusks, outside the tusks, is on the collar of Schnimmet from uh, the Dashur treasures found by uh, Jacques de Morgan. And it, it's, it's a little detail. You have Wester later on in the writing of the name of Chayan. Uh, you have occasional writings which do have legs, but they're often human legs. But just as a single feline leg with a jackal at the top, uh, that, that, that motif, you really look at it uh, in, in detail, in art historical uh, uh, form, uh, if you isolate it, um, it, it it's there. So maybe in the mid 12th, something is happening um, in a circle of power, which is also a circle of knowledge. And we still haven't worked out that relation, knowledge and power in uh, Egypt. We need to do more work on the, on the, on the chief lector at the palace, the Heri Hagat Heritep, and try to work out what's happening there. Thank you so much, Stephen, for this amazing lectures and for uh, everything that you shared with us. Tonight, I'm really looking forward to having you in Turin for investigating how and when and why our coffin was decorated the way it was and to deliver us another lecture, hopefully in presence where we can welcome again our visitors for live lectures and uh, a live dialogue with uh, our speakers. Thank you so much again and uh, thank you for all of you for being with us tonight. Um, I would just would like to say that next Tuesday, the 13th of July, we will have our last lecture of um, this year, and we will start again after, um, after the summer. Um, the last lecture will be by uh, Dr. Luigi Prada, and it will be in Italian. And he will give a lecture on i geroglifici dei Cesari, un caso di appropriazione culturale nell'antichità. So I hope to see you all next Tuesday. And thank you again to Professor Stephen Kirk. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you.